In March 2014, Dan Schneider took the stage at the 27th annual Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. He was surrounded by stars from some of Nickelodeon's most iconic TV shows, and they were all there to celebrate him winning the first ever Lifetime Achievement Award. You see, Dan played a pivotal role in Nickelodeon's success from the mid-90s onwards. He was the creator of many of the network's most popular shows, such as Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, and iCarly. Without him, Nickelodeon wouldn't have been able to compete against Disney with their lineup of shows like The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, Hannah Montana, and Wizards of Waverly Place. You'd expect the higher ups at Nickelodeon to want to hold on to him for as long as they could, since the man just kept making hit after hit. But in 2018, it was announced they'd be cutting ties with him. Almost overnight, Schneider disappeared from public view and returned home with the $7 million still owed on his contract. This was shocking news at the time, but it started to make sense when information came to light about the kind of man he was behind the scenes. It turns out, before the announcement about the separation, Paramount, the parent company of Nickelodeon, had investigated Schneider in depth. They found that while many co-workers praised his attention to detail and work ethic, there were many he worked with that viewed him as abusive. Apparently, he had a vicious temper and would often lash out at people over the smallest things. It was also common for him to do things that were inappropriate for the workplace, such as making his employees give him neck and shoulder massages while on set, or texting child actors outside of working hours. He made many people really uncomfortable, but no one dared to stand up to him because they knew if they did, he'd make life very difficult for them. At the end of the day, I love it when the cast gets sassy with me because I get to write all the scripts with some very talented writers, but I get to, I can put them in any horrible predicament I choose. Where things get really weird is when you look back at the shows he made and notice some of the recurring themes. Feet being a regular focus on screen, shots that look extremely suggestive, and jokes that are nothing short of sexual innuendo. You want to get slapped with a sausage? Sure. Schneider was bringing all his thoughts to life through his teenage casts, and the results are disturbing. But there were even more sinister things going on behind the scenes. In 1996, Amanda Bynes joined the cast of All That, a sketch comedy show on Nickelodeon created and written by Schneider. During her time on the show, she became a standout star, with her comedic timing and natural charm distinguishing her from her peers. She quickly became Dan's favorite, and they grew very close. On set, there'd be times where she'd be missing for hours, apparently speaking privately with Dan to discuss ideas and go through scripts. Their relationship was very different from the relationships Dan had with the other kids, and eventually he gave Amanda her very own show called The Amanda Show. Here she really got to shine, supported by actors like Drake Bell. But with her now being the main character on a show, Dan had an excuse to spend even more time with her. There are many pictures and videos from that time that show Schneider was far from professional around her, often holding and touching Amanda in inappropriate ways. Recently, people have been looking back at one scene he wrote into the Amanda show, which was pretty creepy. In the scene, Amanda's interviewing Schneider while in a jacuzzi with him. She's dressed in a bathing suit while he's fully clothed. Hey, the the show. Uh, yes, I'm the executive producer and the head writer. Actually wrote the words for saying to each other right now. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I actually I wrote this whole conversation that we're having right now. Amanda was in her early teens when this was filmed, while Schneider was in his 30s. Although it might have seemed innocent at the time, in the context of his fixation on her, many now view the scene differently. When Amanda got a bit older, Dan created a new show for her called What I Like About You. This show was more mature than her previous projects, and Schneider used the opportunity to write in numerous raunchy scenes for her. Aww, I love duckies. Uh-oh. <laughs> duckies are moving. Duckies are moving. At this time, Amanda was still underage at 16 years old, but Dan constantly sexualized her. There was a scene dedicated to showing how short her skirt was, one with her cake sitting, which is a corn category for people with a food fetish, and one with her sister smearing chocolate across her chest before wrestling her on the floor. God bless America. This type of writing became a habit for Dan because he's written similar, if not more suggestive scenes for other child actors we'll discuss later in the video. During the second season of The Amanda Show, a dialogue coach called Brian Peck joined Schneider's team. Brian was well established in the industry, having worked on various different shows such as Keenan and Kel and Boy Meets World. Like Dan grew close to Amanda on set, Brian grew close to Drake, spending far more time around him than any of the other kids. Drake's dad, Joe Bell, was his manager and would often accompany him to set. He noticed that Peck would constantly touch Drake, doing things like putting his arm around his waist or running his hands down his arms. He recorded a video he saw of Peck 
back on the set of Growing Pains, where he saw him touching Leonardo DiCaprio in a very similar way. This made him feel uneasy, and he spoke to production about his concerns. They ended up telling him that Peck is gay, and apparently they said, maybe you're just homophobic and you don't understand that he's a touchy-feely guy. My dad would go to executives and say that there's behaviors on set between adults and minors that he's finding uncomfortable, and they would shoo him away. And they, and so, I mean, if that's their idea of an investigation, I mean, it's very faulty, and I don't think that they would discover anything with an investigation like, oh, you don't understand, he's just that way. That's just the type, of, that's just how he is. Brian got a sense that Joe was suspicious of him, so he began driving a wedge between him and Drake, telling Drake lies like his dad is stealing his money, that nobody likes that he's on set, that he's a real problem, etc. He knew he'd never be able to get close enough to Drake with his dad in the picture. Drake was just a kid, so he believed the lies Peck told him, and he began to grow distant from his father. Totally convinced me that my dad needs to be out of the picture and he needs to be managing me and introducing me to the right agents and producers and directors and getting me the roles, that, you know, and kind of guiding my career because this is what you want to do and I can help facilitate you to get to where you want to go. Eventually, Peck saw an opportunity to sink his teeth in further by exploiting the broken relationship Drake's parents had. He started manipulating Drake's mum, telling her all sorts of things about Joe, and before long, she and Drake agreed to remove Joe as his manager. This devastated him, but he wanted to do as Drake wished, so he stepped aside, handing over everything like the bank account and paperwork to Drake's mum. Before he left the picture though, he took her to one side and gave her a warning. He told her never to leave Drake alone with Brian Peck under any circumstances, and if only she'd listened. Brian was an admirer of John Wayne Gacy, the American serial killer and sex offender who committed numerous unspeakable crimes. Gacy became known as the Killer Clown after performing as Pogo the Clown at fundraising events and hospitals throughout the years of his murders. He would lure his victims to his home, often with the promise of a job offer, and that's where he would commit his crimes. Kyle Sullivan, one of the kids who worked at Nickelodeon, said he discovered a self-portrait of Gacy in Peck's house during a barbecue he hosted once. The portrait was of him in a clown costume and it was signed, to Brian, I hope you enjoy the painting. Best wishes, your friend, John Wayne Gacy. Peck also kept a stash of letters and photos from Gacy in the nightstand next to his bed. And according to Sullivan, he was very proud to show them off. In one of Dan Schneider's shows called Guys Like Us, Peck could be seen playing a clown called Mr. Happy Pants around young kids. The signs were always there that he was a dangerous man. At the time Drake's dad was cut as his manager, production for The Amanda Show had ended, but there was still time before production for Drake and Josh would start. During this window, Peck started spending even more time with Drake, going to his concerts, taking him to Disneyland, and driving him to auditions. We were going to auditions, and my mom lived in Orange County, which is an hour away from LA, so Brian was like, no, I can take him to the audition. Like, you don't have to drive all the way up to LA. And then it started to get to where Oh, well, he's got three auditions today. We're going to be done late. Why doesn't he just stay at my house? I'll take, I'll bring him home in the morning. This is where things took a very dark turn. One morning when Drake was just 15 years old, he woke up to Peck actually assaulting him. He was in shock when he realized what was happening and didn't know what to do or what to say. Peck began apologizing to him, telling him he made a mistake and it won't ever happen again. But of course, he was lying through his teeth. Drake was scared and confused, so he kept the whole thing to himself. But by doing so, things carried on as they were, with him having to stay over at Peck's house every time he went into the city. As you can probably guess, the abuse continued again and again and again. Eventually, Drake ended up getting a girlfriend and he began spending a lot of time at hers. One day, while he was over at her place, Peck started ringing him. He'd planned for them to go to Disneyland, but Drake didn't want to. Peck wouldn't take no for an answer, so he kept calling him over and over, and Drake's girlfriend's mom realized something was off. She took Drake into the kitchen, closed the door behind them, and asked him what was going on. He tried to play it off, but she kept digging, insisting that no 40-something-year-old man calls a kid like that. Drake didn't give much away. He just said things were getting a bit weird between him and Brian, and he was trying to distance himself. But his girlfriend's mom sensed something was wrong, so she took matters into her own hands. She told Drake's mom she suspects he's in danger, and arranged for him to see her therapist. Drake went along with this, but he didn't tell the therapist what was really going on. 
It wasn't until one day when Peck tried to worm his way into playing the role of the dad in Drake and Josh that Drake finally broke. While on the phone to his mum, he just exploded and let everything out and she immediately called the police. That evening, Drake sat down with two detectives and told them everything. Then he called Peck to get him to admit his guilt on a tapped phone, which he did with a full confession. During the legal proceedings that followed, dozens of people in the industry came to Peck's aid, despite what he was being charged with. They wrote letters of support imploring the judge to just give Brian probation, even going so far as to victim blame by saying Peck must have been tempted or pressured. One of the letters said, I could only imagine he was pressured beyond belief until he finally caved in and all of the letters were saying that I was the one at fault, that I was the one that was coaxing him into doing what he did, that I was the one that he had to be under so much pressure and a victim of jail bait and that it was my fault, I was asking for it. Ultimately, there was no getting away from it and Peck pleaded no contest. Despite the severity of his crimes, he received just 16 months in prison. After he got out, he jumped right back into the industry, getting a job at Disney Channel, working on the sweet life of Zack and Cody. Since then, he's worked on various different projects according to his IMDb. I'd love to say Brian Peck's case was the only one of this nature at Nickelodeon, but there were several others like it at the network. In the years following this, Dan Schneider came out with shows like Zoe 101, Victorious, and iCarly. Each of these shows were extremely popular and had a massive fan base. But just like Schneider sexualized Amanda Bynes on her show, he did the same to the girls on these shows. There's a notorious scene he wrote into Zoe 101 where Alexa Nicholas, who plays Nicole, sprays some goo on Jamie Lynn Spears' face and it looks very much like a money shot. Alexa has told this story since and apparently they had to redo the scene multiple times while everyone in the room was laughing. Like they were like all laughing, later. even yeah. the prop person. Everyone thought it was hilarious. How did ja do you know how Jamie Lynn felt in that moment? Or was she just kind of like? I thought you can tell she looks uncomfortable. You see really? that shot. Yeah, she does look uncomfortable in it. I felt bad for her in that shot, just because yeah. like no one should be. It's like dehumanizing, you know. Yeah. It's like that's a child, and then everybody on set's laughing about it. Yeah, and then you're like the joke. Almost. You're the joke like, yeah. of, of fake. Come <laughs> on your face, and you're a minor. Oh, it's so bad. It's so, and and it, that's why I say like it's unforgivable, regardless of anything with Dan, whatever he wants to say. Because if you're an adult, if I was him, I would have never have allowed that to happen. Yeah. But it seems like Schneider got enjoyment out of putting the girls in these positions. He did the same thing with Ariana Grande while she was on Victorious, except with her, he had her saying all kinds of provocative things. Oh man, my uvula got stuck between that hamster's toes. See, that could never happen because your uvula is that swingy thing in the back of your throat right here. Sparkly, that's my favorite word. I wrote it down on this banana, see? Sometimes I wonder if you can get juice from a potato. It's shocking that Schneider made her do this and even more shocking that it got the green light. But if he wanted something to happen, he almost always got his way, which would explain why there's such a big focus on feet throughout his shows. Schneider has an obsession with feet and there are countless scenes he's written where feet are the focal point. Feet in ketchup, feet in mouths, feet shooting bows and arrows, you name it. It seems like he'd come up with any excuse he could to make the kids get their feet out. Wow, they're really soft. Have you ever tried to get your whole big toe in your mouth? Check this out. In a podcast she did in 2022, Alexa Nicholas claimed that Schneider would pay to take photos of children's feet on set. She said he had a digital camera and he would go around with money and ask to take photos of the kids' feet, their toes. There are many amateur videos Dan took on set getting uncomfortably close with the kids, so this isn't a stretch to believe, especially when you consider some of the tweets he put out during those years. On the official Sam and Cat Twitter page, he posted a tweet saying, Sam and Cat tomorrow, right on the bottom of your foot, take a pic and use 
hashtag Sam and Kat Saturday. We'll retweet and follow until our fingers get sore. Then on his personal account, he'd promote the scenes in his shows involving feet. Carly tickles Sam's very unusual toes. Would you like to see Victoria Justice pour ketchup all over her feet? Little Ariana Grande from Victoria smiles at one of her co-star's feet. The whole thing was just disturbing. Here he is making a tweet to his wife, his actual wife, and it says, do you want to go for a drive? Do you want to go into our room and watch Too Cute? We have four on our DVR. I'll rub your feet. And I just find it interesting because here he isn't talking about fucking, he's not even talking about children. He's talking about his wife here. And so it really has the clear crossover, right? From children to, to his wife, who I'm guessing he has blank, blank, blank with. The feet stuff is one thing, but Schneider also overstepped the line with how touchy he was. You don't have to look far to find pictures of him holding onto the girls in ways you'd only expect their parents to. In many of the photos, you can clearly see how uncomfortable they are, while Dan is smiling ear to ear. That's the thing about Schneider. He gave no mind to how the things he said and did affected people. She say nice things about me? Because I will tase her if necessary. <laughs> Uh oh. I have the taser. We haven't had to use it in a long time. But I it's... said lots of nice things. These videos made me so nervous. No. Why? It's too bad I didn't cast a pretty girl to play oh, your girlfriend. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Man. That's a little joke because you're ridiculously beautiful. Hey. Why are you sitting on the floor of the set? Because we are. Jeanette McCurdy, who played Sam in iCarly and Sam and Cat, is one of the actors who's spoken out about her experience on set. In a book she published in 2022, she recounted stories, many of which involving the creator, who is widely believed to be Dan Schneider. Jeanette described him as having two sides, one being generous and over-the-top complimentary, and the other as mean-spirited, controlling and terrifying, and capable of making grown men and women cry with his insults and degradation. She spoke of a dinner in which he placed his hand on her knee and massaged her shoulders, but she was too afraid to tell him to stop. She also mentioned a time the creator pressured her to drink alcohol, and another where he insisted she wear a bikini for a scene despite her clearly not wanting to. Later in the book, she recalled a phone call she had with her management company, where they told her Nickelodeon was offering her $300,000. Apparently, it was framed as a thank you gift, but it came with a catch. They wanted her never to talk publicly about her experience at Nickelodeon, and specifically, her experience with the creator. To put it simply, they were offering her hush money, and Jeanette refused. The child stars at Nickelodeon weren't the only ones to fall victim to Schneider. Former All That writer Kayla Alpert said that on her first day writing for the show, Dan stated that women were not funny and dared her to name a single funny woman. Christy Stratton and Jenny Kilgan, two writers for The Amanda Show, were forced to split a salary and then constantly subjected to sexist jokes and verbal abuse. According to Jenny, Schneider would often send them instant messages which he would ask them to read out loud. At first, the things I had to say were harmless, like scream hammers, but quickly they became extremely degrading as he pressured them to say things like, I'm an idiot and I'm a slut. If they refused, he'd send the message again in caps and shout say it until they did. Dan got off on the power he could exert over these women, and his desire for control repeatedly came at the expense of others. One time, while Christy was telling a story about high school, he insisted she lean over the table and pretend she was being sodomized as she told it. She didn't want to do something so humiliating, but he wouldn't take no for an answer, so reluctantly, she did it. Dan recently did an interview where he addressed Quiet on Set, the documentary this video is based off. While he denied many of the allegations his former staff made, he admitted that if he were to go back now, he'd do things differently. But it all just feels like too little, too late. When I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes and it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those earlier years of my career and bring the growth and the experience that I have now and just do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. Um, look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids and we definitely did that, but if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I. I'd just be nicer as often as possible and listen more to the people on my team. And um, I would do everything that I could to make sure that everyone had a good experience.